All right, this is gearing up to be a consequential week for Donald Trump in one of the federal cases that he's facing, as well as for some of his co-defendants in Georgia. The former president has until tomorrow to respond to the special counsel's request for a gag order in his election interference case. Now, you may recall that over a week ago, Jack Smith asked for a narrow gag order against Trump, prohibiting him from attacking prosecutors, jurors, or anyone involved in the legal proceeding. Then on Tuesday, the legal focus will turn from Trump's criminal exposure to one of the several criminal, I'm sorry, civil cases that he's facing when the judge presiding over the New York Attorney General's fraud case rules on motions that could either narrow or even throw out that case. Also on Tuesday, we're expecting a hearing in Georgia regarding Fulton County DA Fonnie Willis's request to keep potential jurors' identities secret in the upcoming trial of two of Trump's co-defendants. Kenneth Chesbrough and Sidney Powell are set to stand trial next month, both of whom have until Wednesday to file any pretrial motions. So a lot to get through here. I'm joined now by two of MSNBC's finest legal analysts, Lisa Rubin, who is a former litigator, and Melissa Redman, who is a former deputy district attorney in Fulton County, Georgia. Welcome to both of you. Thank you for uh, being with us. Lisa, let me start with you. I talked to somebody yesterday who took exception, actually, to characterizing what uh, Jack Smith has asked for as a gag order. Um, he's asking for, and I think it's really important to make sure that in, in Jack Smith's indictment of Donald Trump, he makes clear on the second page of it yep. that Donald Trump's got First Amendment rights to deny the election, to lie about the election, to pursue any remedies that he wanted to pursue, to change or, you know, make sure the outcome of the election was what he thought it would be. So Jack Smith seems to be very clear on the fact that anything he says that Donald Trump should or shouldn't do, Donald Trump is going to cry foul, saying he's violating his First Amendment rights. Explain this so-called gag order request. Yeah, so first of all, I'm one of the people who would probably take exception at describing it as a gag order, too, for the same reasons that your friend described. What is happening here is an effort to restrain Trump and his legal team speech only insofar as it poses a danger to people who are participants in the process, literally their physical security and safety, right. and or endangers the integrity of the process. Beyond that, as Jack Smith says in the indictment itself, everything else is fair game, especially because Donald Trump is a political actor who has political speech rights. Where I think it gets a little bit sticky is some of the comments that Trump has made that Jack Smith takes exception to. For example, describing the people of Washington, D.C. as having particular proclivities or biases. Those are the people that formulate the jury pool here. Right. And if Trump is not allowed to talk about anybody who lives in Washington, D.C., you can see how we get close to an intersection of... First Amendment rights bumping up right. against what's necessary to protect the integrity of this process. And so, Melissa, there are several issues now. Let's say Donald Trump, let's say Jack Smith even gets what he's asking for. Uh, now Donald Trump ends up saying something uh, that either has to be discussed in court because Donald Trump will say, I didn't, I didn't breach the order. Uh, Jack Smith will say he does. Maybe he gets a fine. Maybe he doesn't get a fine. Maybe he gets a second fine. Maybe he doesn't pay the fine. No judge really wants to be involved in this, right? No judge really wants to be the one who sends a, a sheriff or a marshal to arrest Donald Trump because he, he betrayed this, this gag order or whatever it is. So this, the enforcement of this whole thing becomes a problem unto itself. That's exactly right, because not only do we have to define what is meant by harassing and intimidating speech, when he makes a comment, then there's going to be an argument of whether or not that actually violated the order, and then the judge has to decide what to do about it. As you said, is she really going to... Is she going to find him? Is she going to hold him in contempt, put him in custody? That's highly unlikely to happen. And so not only in policing his speech, but deciding what to do about it is going to be a major issue. I anticipate that she will follow through on the warning of moving the trial up, which Trump definitely has indicated that he does not want. They would rather delay this trial. So I think that will probably be the remedy she goes with if there becomes this back and forth of whether or not if that order is issued if he has violated it. And that's an interesting point, because she did say that on the day uh, in which he was remanded. She said, you know, the, the one way I can solve this is make this a speedier trial so that you have less time to sort of pollute the environment. This is not unrelated, uh, Lisa, to what Fonnie Willis is asking for in Georgia, in which she's asking for uh, the secrecy of the jurors to be maintained, in part because it's got to be hell to be a juror in one of these cases, right? You are not just subject to uh, potential actual witness intimidation by the people who are uh, indicted or unindicted co-conspirators, but possibly by 
millions of other people in the country because all Donald Trump or his cronies have to do is make a speech and name you. This has been done before by him. Yeah, this is an area where I'm really interested in what Melissa would say, too, as a former Fulton County prosecutor, because the order that Fonnie Willis is seeking here, intuitively, it makes a lot of sense. When you get into the details, on the other hand, there are some real problems with it because of its potential overbreath. It's okay, for example, to say you can't show the jurors' faces, you can't name their names. But the voir dire process is one in which the public has an interest, too. It matters to people like me what the composition of the jury is. We're trying to assess whether this is a jury of Donald Trump and others' peers, like Chesbro and Powell, right? So there are characteristics that are part of that selection process, like race, gender, age, occupation, even employer that might be salient to the media in covering this trial and giving the public the access that they deserve. On the other hand, Fonnie Willis and her application is essentially asking for all those identifying criteria to also be held secret. So I'm expecting Judge Scott McAfee to, to carve out an order that is somewhere in between the mm -hmm. two so that people like you and me can have access to this trial and report on it and explain it to our viewers without any context whatsoever for who's sitting on this jury and at the same time protecting them from the kind of harassment that we know Fonnie Willis herself and her team have faced. Melissa, I definitely back with Lisa Rubin and Melissa Redman. Um, I want to get right back into it. Melissa, I'm sorry you're not here with us in the studio because um, Lisa just laid out a lot of reasons why there is a reasonable public interest in knowing at least the at least the formation, the, what the jury is constituted of. In, I don't necessarily need to know their names and where they work and their identities. So there may be some way of, of splitting the baby on this. What's your thought? I agree. I believe that the, that Judge McAfee will carve out what is available for the public to know who will be those individuals making this decision without knowing their identities. We don't need to know their names. We don't need to know what, they're, what they look like. We can kind of gauge their demographics um, and publish that, male versus uh, female, their, their, the racial composition of the jury. That, of course, we will want to know. Um, but where they work, we don't need to know. Maybe we want to know what type of work they do, um, with, whether you have, you know, highly educated individuals, whether you have blue collar workers, that type of information. And I think based on what we've seen of the high profile cases in Fulton so far, when we have had concerns about jurors' identities, there's a way for the judge to carve out what information is should be publicly available while protecting those individuals' identities. We don't need to know specifically who they are, where they live, where they work, and that type of information. Uh, let's move on to this issue of uh, Sidney Powell and what are we calling him now? Chesborough, uh, having their cases severed. They, they've put forward, or Chesborough has put forward a list of, I think, 52 potential witnesses. What's happening here? I, th for people like me who don't understand how these things work all that well, are they going to have the entire case as they try these two people, starting, in theory, on October 23rd, the same case that we're going to see against the other uh, defendants and Donald Trump? That's what Fonnie Willis and her team have said. They said in open court that they have 150 witnesses, they believe it's going to take four months to try, and that it will be the same case for the prosecution, regardless of how many defendants there are. Of course, on the defense side, that's different, right? Ken Chesbro and Sidney Powell they just, may want, not, they just want their case. They want their case and they want yeah. to disclaim responsibility yeah. for the yeah. other aspects of the RICO charge and say that it is overbroad and brings them in to a conspiracy with people that they never knew, never could see, never knew about. So I think they're going to want to keep the focus pretty much on the allegations specifically against them. But you're right to say there are 52 people on this list. Does one person need 52 witnesses? My guess is that that is an overrepresentation of who Ken Chesbro will call at trial at the Got same it. time. Anyone who's not on that list is unlikely to be a Got witness it. for Ken Chesbro at trial. And having said that, looking at that list, I see some names that make me think to myself, why would Ken Chesbro think that person's going to be an effective witness for him? Number one example of that to me is Boris Epstein, who has some criminal exposure of his own, has right. never been named as a defendant or a co-conspirator. But what makes Ken Chesbro think that Boris Epstein isn't going to take the fifth right. if called as a witness in Ken Chesbro and Sidney Powell's criminal So you're trial? saying this might be the total list of what might actually happen? Yes, could be, but likely to be a smaller group. Melissa, I, I heard a, a prosecutor tell me last night, this is a great idea, that it's actually, as much as this seems like it might be disadvantageous to uh, Fonnie Willis, it's a great idea. He said, as a, as a RICO prosecutor in Georgia, he used to like it if he got to do a dry run case before the main case, because then everybody can see that he's loaded for bear, and you now might want to make a deal or, or do something else. What's your thought? 
Absolutely. And that's assuming it goes well for the state, right? So if you have, you want to put forth your strongest case, of course, the defense is going to want to confine the conspiracies in question. We see in the indictment, there are about eight different types of conspiracies all in furtherance of this enterprise. Chesboro and Powell want to confine the case to just those that relate to their actions. The state is wanna, going to want to put on the whole case and educate the jury and the public. It is going to be a very public trial about the strength of their case and proving the entirety of the conspiracy. Um, but absolutely, you will want, you know, assuming it all goes well, all this evidence comes out um, to further the, the fact that they can prove, in fact, beyond a reasonable doubt, that all of these individuals engaged in this Ill illegal conduct, and we can prove it, we've proven it in these two cases, I do expect if it is successful, that you will see some defendants kind of having a business decision of what, what are my risks what are my benefits? Do I want to kind of get out of this while I can?